Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our students online as well. Everyone can, can hear me okay? Okay. All right. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll pick up from where we stopped last week. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much once again for this new week that you've given us in each of our lives, oh God. We thank you for this gift of life and this wonderful opportunity, Lord, just to come together and to learn about the local church and, and the way that you, Lord, established your church, oh God. And even as we learn, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will speak in, in, in our hearts, minister to our hearts, Lord. We commit each one of us in this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So uh, last class, uh, we covered quite a bit. We looked at the emergence of leaders, uh, emergence of elders, emergence of deacons. Um, uh, we looked at the church in Jerusalem, and then also briefly about in Ephesus, how there were overseers. Uh, and so we stopped at... Is it uh, emergence of, okay, we finished emergence of senior leaders and pastors, right? We started fivefold ministers and team ministry. Yes? Right? Okay, we'll start from there. So, one of the, you know, interesting things that happened in the early church, one of the features that we see in the book of Acts is that we have these different functions, right? The pastors, apostles, evangelists. Uh, administration, overseers, and all of these th people. But one interesting aspect is all of them worked together. They never looked at each other as, okay, you are you know, in administration, or you are an apostle, uh, or I'm just a teacher. It, it, it was not looked upon like that. right? So all the ministries, whatever function that people had, they worked together. There was this one mindset that we are here to strengthen the body of Christ. Right? That's, in, that's really good. And I think over time, I'm not saying that, that this whole thing has gone away, but what I'm saying is, as a church, it's very important to understand that God gives us different gifts, but our responsibility is that these gifts are used to build God's kingdom. So we are never to look at it as he is better or she is better, this task is better, teaching is better. No. All of them work together to build the body of Christ. right? Uh, and if you look at the church in Antioch, it's an interesting case study. Let's look at some of the lessons that we can learn in the church of Antioch. Everyone know the church of Antioch? Yes? The church of Jerusalem had started. Persecution happened. Believers went to different places, and uh, the church in Antioch was established. So, um, you know, the, the leaders in Jerusalem sent Barnabas to Antioch. You lead the go look after the church there, and then Barnabas goes and looks for Saul of Tarsus, brings them to Antioch. Now, the interesting thing about Antioch is they were already, even though they were a small church, young church, this church was already established itself in terms of the gifts of the Spirit and the functions in the church. So there were pastors, apostles, everyone. The five-fold ministry was continually working in this church. Okay, So let's look at a few uh, things that happened in the church uh, in Antioch. The local church is the place where ministries are to be birthed and equipped and released. So in the church in Antioch, New ministries were birthed, people were equipped, they were trained, and they were released to do the ministry. Right? It, was all, it all happened in the local church. If you look at it, the Antioch church was spiritually stronger. Okay, I wouldn't say stronger, but they were, they were at a very mature level compared to the church in Jerusalem. Right? Because they had already had pastors, apostles, trained up in the church and released to go to do ministry. Secondly, all ministries, the fivefold ministries and others, need to be rooted in the local church for spiritual refreshing and accountability. Now, what is the fivefold ministry? We know it. All, all of us know the fivefold. You should know this 
at the tip of your fingers, right? The fivefold ministry, all ministries are to be rooted in the local church. Think of this. Why, why should it be rooted in the local church? For spiritual refreshing and accountability. Now, let me tell you this. Example, there's an evangelist. Okay? Example, a person becomes an evangelist. And he's traveling to many places. Right? He goes to different parts of our nation or different nations of the world. He's visiting many places. Now, even though he's an evangelist, even though he's always traveling, it is very important for him or her to be rooted in a local church. Very important. right? So think of it this way. As a local church, Right, as a person, as a person who's serving in the ministry, you must be rooted in a local church. Now, I, I cannot say, Hey, I'm an evangelist, so uh, I'll do whatever I feel like doing. Yes, the calling is different, the type of ministry is different, but you got to be rooted in a local church. You get what I'm saying, right? You may be a pastor or a teacher, right? Or, or, or for example, you know, you could be an apostle who's moving about many places you've got to be rooted in a local church one for spiritual maturity two for spiritual refreshment we have to be able to you know be accountable to the local church now for example there's an evangelist right now uh, uh, what i'm talking is a lot of practical things right you you, there's an evangelist, he's doing ministry, it's been about two or three years, he's doing a good ministry, but there comes a time in his life, either his personal life or his ministry, where he feels down, he feels out, he feels, okay, things are not going the right way, and uh, you know, you just feel lost at times. Who is he going to go to? He's going to go to God, okay, but if he needs spiritual counsel, if he needs some kind of growth, if he needs some kind of person to, min to be ministered to, he has to be part of a local church. Or what if he has fallen, right, in, in terms of his, his, in his spiritual life or, or in, in terms of morality, he has, you know, done something wrong, maybe cheated financially or cheated with, a part, with his own, uh, a husband or wife. Now, he needs to be accountable for what he did, he or she, whoever. Right? Now, where can we be accountable? In the local church. Right? Now, I do understand that over time we grow, we mature in Christ, we get to a place of you know maturity, but not one of us are invincible. It's not like nothing can happen to us. We've got to be rooted. Right? We, we, we can be 20 years in ministry. Still, we need to be rooted in some kind, in a local church, be a, a accountable to people. And that we see in the church in Antioch. They were accountable to each other. Right? Uh, in Antioch, Barnabas and Paul, while they ministered, they were accountable to each other. Uh, so there's a question here. Are the ministries in the fivefold ministry should be rooted in the local church? How about believers? Yes. So all the believers must be rooted in a local church, Daniel. So right, we we must be rooted in a local church, and we'll talk about that later. What, what, why is it important, right? So all ministries, pastors, elders, deacons in the fivefold ministry and other believers coexist together and function together in the local church. You get that word coexist. We are not independent of each other. Now the pastor cannot say, "Okay, I'm doing this. This is my ministry. I'll do it my way," or "I will do it alone." No, it's not going to work that way, right? We, we, we have different people, different gifts, different callings, and we use all of them coexist together to build a local church. Yes. For example, you go to the Bible College here. You've got a few teachers, some of us as faculty. We come, we teach, we go. This is our what God has called us to do. But there are many others in the local church who are life group leaders. They also teach. Right? There are youth who are doing many kinds of ministries. Right? 
teen ministry. Now, just because we are teaching in the Bible college doesn't mean we are greater. You get what I'm saying? Just because we are preaching on Sunday doesn't mean we know everything. No. We must coexist with one another. And the point is to see that the local church is built up. That's the point. Now, as a pastor or as a leader, if my goal is only to put myself in the pedestal, everyone should see me and I should be known, I have failed because I've not raised up other leaders. I'm not able to coexist with each other. And the body of Christ is not growing. Every Sunday we are going, preaching, coming back. The body of Christ is not growing. So we see that as leaders, we must be able to coexist with each other, right? To build a local church. And why should we do this? How should we do this? We must complement each other, support each other, enrich each other, and very importantly, not competing with each other. Now, in a local church, let's take APC for an example. How many ministries we have? Quite a few, right? You've got the life group ministry, men's ministry, women's ministry, teens ministry, uh, children's, ch children's ministry, youth ministry, what else? Publications. So there's so much media team, there's so many teams. And with all these teams, I cannot say, you know, hey, I, I want my ministry to be the best. Now, if I think of it that way, something is wrong. Because I must think of it in a way that, hey, whatever God has given me, whatever ministry God has placed in my hand, I should do my best complementing each other. Right? So, for example, now, uh, let me just share this. When I've shared this before, I think, but I don't know if it was this, cl this uh, class. When we have a conference, we work six months ahead. Six months ahead. So, for example, we have a men's conference in December, right? So, in the month of June, right, before the month of June, all the preparation should have been done, meaning the speakers, the venue, Everything, the date, everything is fixed. Okay. From the month of June, start your promotions. Now, can I go to people in the church and say, come for men's conference? Come for me. I can do it one or two Sundays. After that, I can't do it. So I have to communicate to the media team. I have to tell, first, I will, uh, go to the media team and say, okay, this is what I need. This is the venue. This is the time. These are the speakers. Make a graphic. Make a graphics so that we can send it out. They will make it. Then, OK, then we need a video, like a small video, promotional video. OK, that's done. Then I go to the IT team. The IT team sends out the uh, email six months before. Right, The email goes, coming up, men's conference, December. Then uh, uh, after that, the first email, then you have another email after about two months. Then the third email. Then I go back to the IT team, send the message, a WhatsApp message. So, and then now for the conference, I need people, I need volunteers, right? I can't be doing everything there. So I go to the worship team. I say, we need a team. We don't need a full band, four people, three singers, two guitarists, one drummer, more than enough. 30 minutes worship, afternoon, 15 minutes set. So can you sort that out? Okay. Then I go to the Build church, church members, and I say, okay, I need volunteers, right? So I choose volunteers. I say, okay, these are the, these are the volunteers. These are the teams I need volunteers in. So registration, there's book table, everything, right? Uh, food and arrangements. Can I do this alone? No, it's not possible. So in a local church, we must learn to work together complement each other, support each other without competing with each other. Right? Now, there may be you know, differences. I may want a certain image in a certain way. The media team may say, hey, no, if we put the image this way, it'll look better. Now, because they are expert in that, I may say, OK, yeah, I think you, you know better. You know what to do. Right? So for example, you know, uh, um, youth ministry, right? Uh, Sam is here, uh, youth pastor. 
normally what I do is if I want to start a life group, I go to Sam. Hey, Sam, you know all the youth. Right? I don't know many of them. I go to East. But you know all the youth. So he knows which youth, where they are, which level of, you know, which level of maturity they are in, whether they can lead a group, everything he knows. Because he's the youth pastor. He knows everyone, right? So he, uh, I go to him, hey, is there anyone who can start a life group? And then he tells me, okay, there are these people, right? Tentative, hold on. I'll let you know when you, we can start. And so even right now, we, we are in talks. You know, there are a couple of, there's a list of names that we are talking about. We're going to start life groups. Now, I can't do it on my own. Some of those names, I don't know who they are, right? But he knows. So I communicate with him. I talk to him. I say, okay. So Sam, when do we do this? Uh, he, he, so he'll give me the heads up. Okay, Paul, these people, out of six, these three, you go ahead and help them to start. So I'll give them a life group leaders training, get them started. So now we've got, I, I, I am there to help them, to support them. But even as a youth pastor, he, Sam is there to, you know, hey, just making sure everything's right. Is it two different ministries? Yes. This is youth ministry and it's life group ministry. But we are working together. You get what I'm saying? Right? And especially when the church grows, you need it. You can, we cannot work alone. And that is why in APC, we've established the whole thing of teams. We work as a team. There is not, there's nowhere where you see one person is glorified or one person is given all the credit. It's always a team. Right? And it's good to do this because what you're doing is you're, 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 you're establishing the local, meaning you're, you're setting things in the church. You're, you're building this uh, attitude or this culture of teamwork, right? And so we see that here as well. Uh, the next point we see is the calling and ministry of some people will require them to go out to different places, uh, whereas others may be called to minister in the local church. So again, uh, we, we know a lot of uh, evangelists and like, Ravi Zacharias, Billy Graham, all these wonderful evangelists. They go out to many places, minister, but they're all part of a local church. Right? They, I'm sure they all have, are part of a, you know, a home church that they would have. So there's some of them whose calling is that. There are some who God will say, you'll be here. Stick to this place. Build the church. Raise up leaders. Look ahead, right? So even as each one of you, you know, you plant teams, you start ministries, always learn to raise up others and work as a team, right? So for example, some of you may be in the, you know, the, in the North Church as you are serving, you may be, one person may be part of ushering. So you, you may have some new people coming into church, train them up. So just build a conversation, learn to talk to them. Hey, you're good at this. You join me. Just stand with me. That's it. And then eventually you tell them, did you enjoy? If they say yes, why don't you join the ushering team? There's no big training. How to shake hand. They'll teach you. That's it. A lot of big training. So simple things. And what you're doing is you're from small, from you know, from the time you start off ministry, you know, okay, hey, I have to form a team. That's you know, it's engraved inside you, no matter what. So even when you go out, start your ministries, you'll you'll begin to think that way. Okay, I need people. I need to start a team. And uh, that'll keep your church and your ministry strong. Okay, let's get into the next portion. Different forms of church structure. Okay, Daniel has a question. Pastor, what can we do if the church pastor likes everything on its own instead of building team? Uh, then that pastor is not um, walking in line with the word of God. So um, I feel what you can do is get the leaders together and uh, go and talk to the pastor. Tell him, pastor, I think it's important that we should start teams, uh, raise up a, a, a team. So you, you, I think you, you can. what you can do is take some elders, go and speak to the pastor. You should do that. Okay, different forms of church structure. So you have the clerical system, which is the mainline traditional denominations. I think many of us have come from one of these denominations. Uh, 
Methodist, Anglican, and so many other Baptist. Uh, then in these in this clerical system, there's a distinction between clergy and laity. That means uh, the clergy are the ones who do all the work, are the leaders of the church. They do everything. What does a, a, a laity do? Come sit, listen to the service, go back home. Nothing to do. Right, that's the clerical system. The local uh, clergy are under control over everything. The local parish gets, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's everything is under the control of the leaders, right? Uh, usually in this system, there are a threefold order, which is bishops, priests, and deacons. Right? And interestingly, these are still there, right? Plenty of them all across uh, our nation, all across the world, actually. There is the clerical system that is still functioning. But it's sad because uh, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it doesn't give an opportunity to raise up leaders. So a person can go to a church, right? and be in that church for 20 years and still be in that same level of maturity or not being able to serve in the church. Why? Because he's laity. Right? So they, there's, a, there's a very strong distinction made between these two, right? clergy and laity. Then you have the elder system church, which is led by a group of elders. Right? It is cooperative leadership. Now, what is the problem in this? There is not one pastor leading the church. You've got about four or five uh, elders leading the church. What is the problem? Number one problem is vision casting. Now, for example, I have four people with me. And I say, hey, let's get together. We, we, we've planted the church. We're looking after the church, right? Now, I may have a vision to have three months Bible college. This other person may say, hey, no need Bible college. Let's focus on the church. Now, the other person may say, no, let's have one year Bible college. The other person may say, let's have two years Bible college. Right. Now, what's happening? All four of us are there. We, have, we, we are leaders of the church, but we all four have four different visions. So you ask me, what's your vision? I want to see young people raised up and taking on leadership. This is the next person. What do you want to see? I want to see that this church will grow to, you know, 500 people. So there's nothing wrong, but you see, the vision is different. So when there is, you know, cooperative leadership, progress can be stifled, meaning it can, it becomes very disturbed. It can, it's a place where there is a lot of confusions can happen, disagreements can happen. And keeping the unity in this kind of system is very hard. It's a very stressful thing. Remember Paul and Barnabas? When Paul and Barnabas only had a strife, what did Paul say? What did Barnabas say? Let's take John Mark and go. We're going back to Galatia, right? No, I'm not taking this guy. He left us at Paphos. He just said, no, I'm going home. And he went home. And now you want to take him and go. No, I'm not coming. I'm not. I'm not taking John Mark. You come, we both will go. The strife was so much that Paul and Barnabas separated. Right? For more than two years in their first missionary journey, they were together, stayed together, ate together, slept together, did ministry together for two years. Such a small disagreement, they parted ways. So here's the thing. In, in the elder system, I'm not saying... It's not like it won't work, but it, you really have to be in one mind, right? And there's going to be disagreements. You need to have the wisdom of God to make sure that you know decisions are made unanimously together, uh, and that is that will benefit the local church. And then comes the independent local churches, led by individual pastors and the pastoral team, right? Uh, plenty of room for vision, plenty of room for creativity, plenty of room for growth. Why? Why is it? Because as a these independent churches, right? So, for example, uh, as a pastoral team, we can always we always talk about it, right? We have a pastoral meetings. We always talk about what to do. Right? So, I, I don't know if I was sharing it here, but uh, you know, we we think, okay. So, what do we do now? Bible college ends in May. Of last year right april so what do we do april may june july four months we have 
what do we do? OK, so let's do a short term course, three months course. Right. We'll get people from all across India come study. We'll have it online as well. Those who want to join online can do it online. Um, those who want to, uh, you know, come here and study, they can do it. Now these decisions are made together, right? And certain decisions, uh, when it comes to church, you know, we all make it together, right? And whenever, even uh, as a senior pastor, our senior pastor makes decisions, he always lets us know. It's not like, oh, what do we do now? No, everything is. To given to us, right? Okay, this is what the plan is. If you have anything to say, if you feel you want to change something, let me know. So, as leaders, we have the freedom to go to pastor, a senior pastor, and share. So, what happens? There's a place for vision. There's a place for creativity. There's a place for growth, right? Um, however, the danger is uh, dictatorial leadership, which can be very harmful. Right. And so that's why as a, as a as the senior pastor, you must be conscious of what you're doing. You must, you know, I was just listening to a sermon just now. Um, you know, the greatest, the power in leadership is to have the power to know that you're not in full power. Right. That's the greatest, that's a sign of a good leader. You have the power, but know that you're not in full power. And and so there could be a danger of making all the decisions on your own, doing everything on your own. Uh, and so as a senior pastor, you must be aware. So how Daniel says, he, a, a pastor here who, who wants to do everything on his own, it's a dangerous thing to be, dangerous position. Right? What if you know, some unforeseen thing happens, right? And the pastor is either gets unwell or, or, or something happens, right? Um, what will what will happen to the church, right? So we must understand that raising teams, raising up leaders, is the number one priority as a leader. We see. Are we talking out of our own understanding? No. What did Jesus do? First thing Jesus did was, after his forty days of fasting, he came and he said, "What?" He chose the twelve disciples. He said. Now get ready. Then he chose the 72. Get ready. Go. So it's something that we must do. OK? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, uh, regarding about making raising your leaders, so in our area, what the pastors they'll do is, what the fear they have is, you know, they'll prepare the leaders. They'll raise the leaders. They'll train us for many years. So what they'll do is, uh, they'll go, they, like, you know, they leave the church and they'll start a new church. Mm -hmm. They'll uh, they'll yeah. take all the church believers. And so, what we do for that? Yeah. See, this is very prevalent in India right now. We have to look at it in two ways. Number one is yes, it is difficult when this happens because you've invested in a person for so many years. But this is where we must be kingdom. We must have kingdom mindset. Right now, for example. There's a person that I know, right? This young person, he joins the church. Um, and this happened in Mangalore, right? Young guy. So I gave him all the, you give him all the opportunities. You train them, you take them everywhere, uh, give them opportunities to lead the youth group. So for many years, they're with us. And there'll come a time when they want to start their own ministry. As leaders, a good leader should not be insecure. He should pray over him, bless him, and send him on his way. The moment I say, no, you you stayed with me. For, I trained you for four years. You have to stay here only. That means the pastor is taking control over the person. We do not have control over anybody. Right? God can take somebody right, and use them in a different way. Remember, this is training ground. God can... God has used Moses, you know, uh, trained Moses in the palace, used him in the desert, trained Joseph in the desert, used him in the palace. So our training can be different. So number one is don't be insecure. Okay, so just feel free, leave it. Right. You have trained. See that the seeds that you have sown, your reward is in heaven. 
And you look, you look at the bigger picture. Hey, I've done my part. I've taken this person, trained him, given him opportunities. Now he's ready. Actually, to look at it, you should be happy as a pastor. Yes, go. Plant a church. Right. But I understand where you're coming from because many of them, you know, hey, I, I planted the church. This guy took 20 people and went for my church. Yes, that is hurtful. So what you can do is when a person comes and says, hey, I want to. So this culture you can establish from the beginning. So from, for, for example, in APC, if somebody comes and says, I want to start a church of my own. Uh, say, uh, you know, there's a leader. We have raised him up. He says, I want to start a, a church on my own. We'll pray over them. We'll bless them. We'll release them. But something that we will tell them is, see, we must do it in a respectful way. Go plant your church. We are there with you. We, you want any financial support? How much ever we can, we'll bless you. You need any, any kind of other material help? If there are things that I have, tables, books, anything you need, we'll help you. But make sure that you don't uh, you know that you have divine order meaning don't take members from this church and go there what's happening is you're causing confusion right you go you plant a church no problem right but don't connect with once you move out forget about this believers here you're free to come and talk to me you're free to you know come ask questions discuss all of that is okay but don't take members from here and you know uh, tell them come to my church and all that that would be wrong so this is something that you can tell them right uh, i'm not saying now in india it does happen a lot especially in uh, towns and villages it happens a lot uh, but i think we can change that culture more the churches better right many more lives many more impact more impact uh, remember that you know one of the things I've noticed is pastors worry because where will I get my offering from, right? When believers go, especially in city towns and villages, don't worry. That's something that we must trust God with. And, uh, uh, but that mindset should change. It's come over many years, so it's uh, we should change that mindset, right? Um, failure in proper succession can leave years of hard work into ruin imagine this two examples god chose moses moses brought the people out of egypt they've come near the uh, you know rivers of cardis here almost they're going into the promised land imagine at that time moses is looking okay who's there to take these people into the promised land i'll go i'll go i'll lead them imagine how it would have been would it make sense so they would have all fought among themselves. No, you don't know anything. How can you take us? But it's, the Bible says that God took the spirit of some of the spirit of Moses and put it on the elders and that same spirit on Joshua. When people saw Joshua, they realized he's the guy who's going to take it. Why? Because they knew. They've seen Joshua with Moses. They've seen that mantle is going to move, move into Joshua's life. So nobody opposed it. Nobody said, we don't want Joshua. They were glad. OK, Joshua, he's a good leader. He can take us in. Now imagine if Moses did not do this. It would have been confusion. Maybe those 70 leaders there, they would have all had different ideas. Let's take a left. The other person said, let's take a right. No, we'll wait here for two more months. Joshua knew exactly what to do. This is how we're going to go. Be strong, be courageous. The Lord is with us. We will go to the promised land. So all that hard work was worth it for Moses. When he laid hand on Joshua, he said, OK, I've done my part. The hard work is done. Now, Joshua, you may have another set of troubles. That is yours. But I've done my part. You are the successor. Think of Paul and Timothy. Paul took Timothy as a young boy, 17, 18 years old, very young boy raised him up, trained him. Paul writes and he says, you saw me. You saw my life, Timothy. You saw everything that I did. And he raised up this Timothy. And then when he was looking for a leader for the church in Ephesus, he says, Timothy, you go there. You lead the church. Now imagine uh, Paul thinking, OK, who's going to lead the church? What are we going to do? He had leaders. 
See, he he thought of everything ahead, way ahead. Right? He chose Titus, Epaphras, so many leaders. He, the moment they became believers, he used, he said, okay, start training them. Because I'm not going to be here. Somebody else should take it on. So all the hard work can become nothing, can go to waste if I don't have a successor. And not only in the early church, but if you look at even in the 1900s and uh, the early 1940s, 1950s, uh, there are many, many churches and ministries which cut down because there is no second level of leadership. So all the hard work of planting the church, doing the ministry, I mean, it, it just went away. Of course, there are rewards for that, but then the ministry did not continue. Right? So when we plant a church, when we plant a ministry, always think ahead. If I am not there, who's going to do it after me? Right? Some of the things that we talk, we have something called the emerging young leaders. We and uh, you know, Pastor Sam and uh, you know the team there, they 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 look for leaders. Who can be the next leader? Right? We we want to do that because that's that's something that's going to happen. We are not going to stay young forever. And we can't be doing ministry for it. We need to give people opportunity. That's what ministry is about. Right? And so that is what you can do in an independent church. Go ahead. Can you use the mic, please? So that the others can also hear. Some independent churches, they have their own lineage of family only. They try to keep grooming. Mm -hmm. And in some churches, they leave, uh, set aside the family, and uh, as God leads, they yeah. bring other things. Yeah. So, which is you know uh, kind of you know more healthy, the okay universally. Yes, that's a good church. question. Now, listen, uh, you understand? Everyone understood the question, right? You got to, uh, parents who planted the church, and then they have maybe two or three children, and they're doing everything in the church. Now, there are advantages, there are disadvantages, right? Now, if a person doesn't know how to sing. So for example, the parents, there's, there's a son, he has a son and a daughter, two children. Now the son doesn't know how to sing. He can't keep a note. You can't tell him be a worship leader. You sing because you're there. No. He should have the gift, the grace should be there to lead. Right? If the daughter is, you know, is uh, you say, okay, um, you know, uh, you preach. Or you look after women's ministry, but she's not even interested. Right? And the pastors force and say, no, you do it, you do it. Now she may do it, but it's not going to be fruitful. So then you have children who are God really gives them that gift. And I'm sure you've seen, right? And where the father is, the son is almost the carbon copy when it comes to preaching. And the anointing is there. Right? I can name many of them, especially in South India, we have a lot of them, right? Father's a pastor, two children, both are pastors, and both have the same kind of anointing as the father. And what is the fruit? Both the churches are grown. Both are in healing and deliverance and powerful churches. And we know it's a, it's a gift of God. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that God has ordained. But I also know my own friends who are pastor's children, they started to resent God. Why? Because their parents started forcing them. Relatives come, no, no, you pray. Pray in front of everyone. Everyone should say, see you pray. Forcing them to pray. Forcing them to sit in church. right? Forcing them to sing songs. What happened? They started to resent God. They don't like God. Their father is the pastor of the church. And sadly, one of my friends, who is a, you know, a very close friend of mine, he was a pastor's son. He didn't want God. He didn't like it at all. But he was still seeking God. I would tell him, hey, it's okay. You know, uh, I know you had a tough time growing up. You know, It was always like church, no going for movies, no going out with friends. But you should be there for the youth meeting. You're going to be the next pastor. Be there for the youth meeting. He didn't have a good childhood. Everyone are you know, cycling. His friends are cycling. He has to give up and go to a cell group meeting with the parents. So he resented, what is this? Everyone I enjoy, like, as a child. So as leaders, we must know how to, you know, raise up that. Right? 
So if a, uh, if a pastor's son is interested in, in uh, IT or in um, working, becoming a doctor, let them do what they want to do, right? Engineer, whatever, let them do. And, and so then you, you know, okay. But if, so for example, I have an uncle who's in Bombay who's a pastor, right? He's got three daughters. Now, all three of them are in the worship team. But those three can sing. They have a note. They have a good uh, note. But one of those girls has written many famous, she's become very famous. She's written many songs and all of it. And there was this calling upon her, right, to be a worship leader. But over time, they were able to, you know, slowly just come out of the picture. Slowly they've got getting others to come and lead the worship. So, so what is healthy is to, to identify. As a pastor, you must identify what is the gift that this child has. What is it that they like? Don't force them. Right? That is very, very cru crucial. Right? Very crucial. Right? Like I have two boys. One of them likes music. And I know he likes me because he's always into music. He likes to sing. But I don't force him. You have to play in children's church. You have to sing in children. I say, you do what you want. So he, the last, some, you know, they had in children's church, some program. He said, I want to play the drums. I said, you do what you want. The other one said, I want to dance. I said, go dance. So you don't force them, right? Uh, and they recognize the gift and calling that they have. Right? Uh, that there we have to be wise as Okay. Okay. Then there are network of churches, um, the assemblies of God, the Vineyard Church, New Life churches. These are different network churches, meaning you can have many AG churches, uh, Vineyard churches, New Life churches all across. Uh, they may work on their own, but they are under uh, this network of uh, AG or New Life, right? Uh, but the danger sometimes it could be too much of control, but not always, right? So sometimes you know, you know, mostly these these churches they give independence to the the pastors to do what they feel like doing. Uh, but another challenge could be competition. Hey, we both started in two thousand and ten. This new life, or okay, I don't know. <laughs> this church is. We both started, we were friends. We both started in 2010. 2024, he's got uh, 500 people. I'm still stuck with 100 people here. Something is wrong. Or, you know, it becomes competition. So you got to avoid those kind of things, right? Because especially in these kind of networks, everyone know each other, right? Probably there are reports that are sent and all of that. So, uh, so avoid that competition. Then you have apostolic networks. Uh, a network of churches relating to an apostle. Uh, now, the danger here is meaning uh, it's a single vision, uh, meaning there's a danger of being man-focused, authoritarian. Whatever I say should happen in the church. If I say church starts at 11 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you should start at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Even if it makes sense, it doesn't make sense, that's not, I, I have decided it. So that would be uh, a danger. Um, then in, in this apostolic network churches, the emphasis on covenant relationships, uh, 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 that is, you know, they make covenant relationships with the leaders of the church. Now, this is not prevalent much in India, but it is prevalent in the West, right? Uh, uh, where sometimes this can lead to manipulation. You can say, hey, if you're in covenant relationship with the apostle or the leader, you have to give to God. If you give, God will multiply it. You know that kind of a manipulation. So, you, so we need to be careful in these kind of places. Again, house churches. Now, when it comes to house churches, many of them like it. Many of them don't like it. Right? Um, close relationships is one of the best things in a house church. Right? You. Everyone know each other. There's good fellowship. There's good community. Uh, but um, one of the things that can cause dissatisfaction is the abil inability to meet in larger settings. Right? Sometimes you may get bored seeing the same faces every day. Right? Three years, not even uh, no uh, opportunities to serve in volunteering teams. No opportunity for growth because uh, you're just doing the same thing in a house church. So. 
uh, so the, so people have you know prefer house churches some of them don't prefer uh, but it all depends you know? so for example now and if you look at our nation of india uh, especially up north there's a lot of persecution that's happening and people don't have any choice you have to meet in house churches right uh, to be you know a little bit uh, 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 be careful in terms of ministry so again it's not like you can't grow it's a good place to build fellowship, build community. Many lives can get touched. Uh, so they have their advantages and disadvantages. Then you have the cell-based church, uh, meaning it's like it's like a large congregation. Right? You may have 1,000 people in a church. And then in the 1,000 people, you may have 50, 50, 50 cell churches that meet in different areas. Now, when I say cell churches, it means that they do exactly maybe what happens on a Sunday service. Right? They have... The Lord's table, they have worship, Lord's table, um, you know, uh, the word, ministry time, and close, right? But they work as a cell church and they report to the main church. They're part of the main church, but they work independently as cell churches, right? Um, these are the danger of this is you can form, it can become a splinter groups, like what you were saying, right? Uh, that leader, cell group leader may take all of them and say, hey, come, we are going to. That I'm I'm moving to south of in uh, south side of Bangalore, or wherever they are. So I'm going to plant a church there. Come there. So what happens? It becomes a splinter group, right? And uh, it can cause a te tearing away from the main congregation. So again, we must be careful there. Then you got the mega churches. We all have heard about the mega churches. Yes. Many, many, many mega churches, uh, right, 2,000 people and, and more. It could be a denominational church. It could be a non-denominational church. Common element in these mega churches is they are led by strong leaders, visionaries, people who uh, always forecast their vision, have a, have a heart for God. Uh, and here it is, uh, you know, the pastoral element becomes less practice and less important uh, uh, to the senior leader. Most of the work is done by the senior leader. Um, they have a great impact on society. Now imagine you have 2,000 or 5,000 people in your church. You, you have a great impact on society, right? So you can, you can go into schools, colleges, more impact. People get to know you. I remember this. Uh, one of the churches during COVID here, we have a quite a few mega churches here in India. And one of the churches had those, you know, the car uh, attend service, drive-in church. Right? And the entire nation was talking about this. But, oh, a drive-in church in India and in Bangalore. So many new people came. They wanted to see what's happening. Many lives were touched. Many of them, by listening to what has happened, they, they became believers, right? So we have a kind of an impact over people. Uh, uh, then mega churches are not bad; they are not dangerous. But uh, uh, because of their visibility, uh, any failure or problem within the church could cause great public criticism. While you know smaller churches, nobody may talk about it. But bigger churches, if even if it's a small mistake, it can just be blown up, and it may come in the news and all of these things. So. Uh, Again, what I'd like to say is if you're a big church, big responsibilities, you'll need to also learn how to handle these criticisms that come our way, right? Okay, let's take a break and we'll come back and continue.